What up, y'all? This is Yadon Israel coming to you live from Lit, asking y'all to subscribe to the channel. So make sure y'all subscribed, make sure y'all liking the videos, make sure y'all commenting, and make sure you turn on your notifications that let you know when new videos are dropping. We're dropping them daily, and you want to be on it, because we on it, all right? So keep it lit, keep it locked, subscribe, we out. Mardu says a drink. What's going on, y'all? This is another episode of Lit. I am your host, Yadon Israel, a.k.a. Liddy Fontaine. Pretty Liddy is what they call me. Uh, today's guest, we have Rakesh Satyal. Good. Okay, Good. boom. All right. Mm -hmm. You know, his, his new book, uh, No One Can Pronounce My Name, is in stores now, um, published by Picador, and I did not want to be the person who did not pronounce your name. <laughs> That's right. Thank That's you. Right. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, Pink Pay Productions is the, is the production crew who did this. Shout out to them. Shout out to Danny behind the, um, the, behind the camera. Uh, Lit is the premier platform for all things literary, swaggy, and otherwise, and all of the above. So we're going to get right into this interview. Um, all of our interviews start with the outfit. It's all about the swag. So, yep. you know, stand up. We got to do, we got to, we got a swag cam that we this is, fit. This is, I mean, the pants I appreciate that you, yeah. this shirt, I have to say, it's actually my husband's. Okay. He's 6'2". I don't know how this fits me. It's like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Is he a skinny 6'2"? He's I'm like skinny. Six, he's, yeah, he's skinny. So like, yeah. Yeah, it, you think right. it fit you. Okay. But, uh, you know, I thought. Love this shirt. So you found it at a vintage store. All right, we're back on the let's, 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 let's get the whole. Floor yeah, I got, I got got these. I got the, these um, Adidas Samoa's sneaks. Or, yeah, maybe not Samoa's. Though. Maybe, maybe actually yeah. they might be. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there you go. And I'm, I'm loving the of... vintage New York. I'm like Yogi Bear. Well, I realized this on my book tour that I'll go to cities that don't like the Yankees. I'm just wearing this because I think it looks good. And then I realized I could actually get beat up yeah, by yeah. especially you know. in Boston. Yeah, exactly. And, and then the glasses. I love the frame. These are yeah. These are um, mascot. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, oh, there you go. There's yeah, the, yeah. what is it? I think that store is on 6th and 14th. It's oh, really, that's and right. I never go. Yep, in. yep. All right, man. So, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dope. So, um, where were you? You grew up in what? Uh, Cleveland. I, I actually grew up in Cincinnati. The book is set in Cleveland. Yeah, I mean, um, but, yeah, yeah. but I grew up in, yeah, in Ohio. So, okay. so it's kind of different because Cincinnati is um, southwestern Ohio on the Ohio River. So, it's more conservative than. Other parts of Ohio, Cleveland's a bit more progressive. Okay. Um, but yeah. And by progressive, so. what's that language? Yeah, that's a yeah. good question because progressive in the Midwest is not necessarily progressive elsewhere. Um, but I grew up in uh, I, I, my hometown was about fifty thousand people, so not super super rural, but not yeah. big. Um, as opposed, to my husband grew up in very rural Wisconsin, in a town of two thousand people, so okay. that's very rural. Uh, but I um, and I went to a, a big public high school, um, so I was born and raised there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you, uh, your parents were also born and raised. They were, they actually my parents immigrated in the early seventies, so okay. they met in India when they actually met when they were children. My parents uh -huh. lived. Their fathers were both in the military, and they moved around a lot. But at one point, they they lived kind of next door to each other. Okay. And my mother uh, had three sisters and two brothers, and my father had one brother. So they met there. And um, not they wanted marriage. No, no, actually, which is which is telling because I didn't find this out until many years later after the first of my kind of like Indian kids, you know, when you're out of college, the first to get married. She got married in pretty a, a rather arranged marriage because she was actually um, with somebody else that okay. sort of got was in an arranged marriage. And I realized that in the conversation that evening after that wedding that a lot of the people that I would have assumed wanted didn't believe in arranged marriage of our generation yeah. actually were the other way around and it was vice versa so it was kind of uh, like the, the later generation actually wanted the arranged marriage? Yeah, so they, didn't, okay. they didn't really have an issue with it and some of us didn't really think that that was particularly great that it was happening so um, but my parents, it was in that conversation I found out that my parents had, were the only love marriage and that's kind of dozen or so All right. families. Um, but they, so they met in India, they wanted to get their education first, so they actually, my mother did her master's degree in education at Miami of Ohio, which is about 45 minutes from where I grew I up. the fact that that school is named. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> exactly. um, and then my dad actually did his master's degree there, so they, they were both there and then they, then they got married. They went back to India to get married to have the ceremony, okay. and then they, they lived in the States. All right, so, like, and now, I think, um, coming into, like, what was their, re was the, is their reason for immigrating the reason, like, the better education, mm -hmm. better life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely, you know, my mom came, uh, my mom came from a rather 
kind of studious family. My 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 grandfather, my mother's side, uh, in his later years, he lived to be 95, I think. So in his mm. later years, was kind of almost became like the town wise man. I mean, mm. he uh, he made sure all of his children got a very good education. Um, my mother, my mother, and two of her three sisters were all uh, school teachers. Mm. So um, they all became teachers. And so uh, and my dad, same thing. Where you know he kind of uh, he grew up in even more meager beginnings, and so he always kind of believe in hard work and and um, getting educated and so they they yeah, that was the main reason why they came to the states they had a kind of my, my mom's older brother uh, who was the eldest out of all of them had become a professor and was teaching actually in at Miami of Ohio before he had the good sense to move his family to California where yeah. they then lived but um, but that was their foothold in yeah. being in the states okay yeah. so when does literature enter your life who's your vestibule yeah, I um, I think because my mother, my parents always made sure we had books around us. Right. I mean, that was definitely, um, they really encouraged us not only to do well in school, but they, I, yeah, I think my brother was also enjoyed reading, but it was clear from early on that that was the thing that I really took to, that right. I always was reading. I, I, you know, I was reading, um, like, one of the early books I remember reading when I was, like, maybe six or seven was The Secret Garden, that book. Um, and Who wrote the, that book? I hear the name. This is Hodgson Burnett. I okay. think it was published in 1912 or something. Maybe I could be really off on that year. But, uh, no but it was. But that's a relatively, relatively um, complex book if you're like six years old reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, uh, but yeah, I was really. Um, it's funny because when you make a life as a writer, I think some people from the very beginning identify as such. But I think a lot of us don't realize that we were always urging ourselves towards being writers. So mm -hmm. now when I look back on it, I was always kind of writing stories and making little books of my own. And I remember one time I took, we had this um, illustrated uh, version of Snow White, the, Di the, the Disney version of it. And I remember copying out every page because I wanted, like, I loved kind of replicating it. Yeah. And then I got halfway through my older brother in that kind of tormenting elder sibling way was like, you know that's illegal because they have a copyright on that thing. He's four years older. So then I threw it away because I was like, this doesn't count, you know, but he was, how, you know, how old was he? He's he was four years old, so he was, at the time, he was probably about eight years old. Was eight year old, no, uh, he, you know, but probably he was, <laughs> was where? Uh, I'm learning copyright. Yes, exactly. He was, yeah, see, so, you know, the <laughs> did he learn to control me as a younger sibling? But, but I, but there was that, you know, um, intention there yeah. to, like, be, creating books, writing books. Um, my mother would bring these like white blank books that they would use like as copy books in her mm -hmm. elementary school class and I would write stories in those. So it was always part of, you know, okay. kind of creating. And I see being. you brought some Edith Wharton. I did. Well, I brought this because you had mentioned that like yeah. something that may have had an impact on me, um, a Metro card book, book, bookmark. That's how you um, know this is real. Yes, ex exactly. On location. Uh, so, I was read, so this is, um, I love... All, I, I started reading her work, I think, when I was in middle school and then read everything she had written. Okay. Um, and so I thought you about the read. I'm just going to read from the very beginning of The Custom of the Country, which is actually, uh, it's generally regarded to be one of her kind of bigger works, but I feel like it's one that people don't mention as readily as they do The Age of Innocence, which I love, or okay. or um, House of Mirth, or Ethan Frome. And, um, so I'm just going to read from the very beginning of it, because there's this, like, jollity to it and it's all very it's all social observation you know okay. her, her writing so i'll read like a page and a half of this but Dean Sprague, how can you, her mother wailed, raising a prematurely wrinkled hand heavy with rings to defend the note which a languid bellboy had just brought in. But her defense was as feeble as her protest, and she continued to smile on her visitor while Miss Sprague, with a turn of her quick young fingers, possessed herself of the missive and withdrew to the window to read it. I guess it's meant for me, she merely threw over her shoulder at her mother. Did you ever, Mrs. Heaney, Mrs. Sprague murmured with deprecating pride. Mrs. Heaney, a stout professional-looking person in a waterproof, her rusty veil thrown back, and a shabby alligator bag at her feet, followed the mother's glance with good-humored approval. I never met a lovelier form, she agreed, answering the spirit rather than the letter of her hostess's inquiry. Mrs. Sprague and her visitor were enthroned in two heavy gilt armchairs in one of the private drawing rooms of the Hotel Stentorian. The Sprague rooms were known as one of the Louis suites, and the drawing room walls, above their wainscoting of highly varnished mahogany, were hung with salmon pink damask and adorned with oval portraits of, or, portraits of Marie Antoinette and the Princess de Lamballe. In the center of the florid carpet, a gilt table with a top of Mexican onyx sustained a palm and a gilt basket tied with a pink bow. 
But for this ornament and a copy of The Hound of the Baskervilles, which I also loved as a kid, which lay beside it, the room showed no traces of human use, and Mrs. Spragg herself wore as complete an air of detachment as if she had been a wax figure in a show window. Her attire was fashionable enough to justify such a post, and her pale, soft-cheeked face with puffy eyelids and drooping mouth suggested a partially melted wax figure which had run to double chin. Mm. So let's stop there. But that I was, like that. I loved, you know, there, there's immediately this sense of place, of character. Dialogue enters the picture very early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, later when I got in life, the more I knew about Edith Wharton and how um, she was kind of this champion for aesthetics. So she had very yeah. particular ideas of how um, she wrote a very, at that time, a very big book called The Decoration of Houses, which I think predated the publication of House of Mirth, which was mm -hmm. her first novel. But th there was this real, everything's kind of woven into each other in yeah. itself. So it's social commentary and almost economic commentary, right. and then there's almost class that enters the picture. So I picked up on all of those things, I think, pretty early reading it. A few things that's interesting to me. One, what I'm really interested in, and I, I don't know if this is true for your education, mm -hmm. but what I realized in retrospect of my education about literaries and just historical figures, you're pres I was presented a lot of work out of context. Meaning, yeah. like, mm -hmm. for example, like I was devastated when I learned that like Karl Marx was a spendthrift, for example. Yeah, right. And like he would spend more money than people lived off of at the time. He would borrow money from his friends and stuff like that. And like, this is the guy who writes. Yes, right. The, you know, the, the pay, like, and so it's just like, what? Yeah, right. But, you know, the more you read about a life, I think the more you understand what is really at play on the page. Yeah, to right. Me. And so, like, it's interesting that when you when you bring up like learning more about Edith Wharton, it gives you more perspective into her writing. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Which is that you know I got what I think is a very good public school education and was encouraged very much by my teachers from from you know a young age, but middle school onward. I mean, I yeah. had very uh, this. The, the the three or four English teachers I had during my school education were some of the coolest people I've ever met. And they were definitely good about um, presenting a canon that leaned more heavily on women, which I appreciated, which I naturally gravitated towards. And they were they were they were rather assiduous about making sure that we learned, we encountered writers of color and and, and, and um, engaged with their work. Right. But I will say that like that's something you learn is that some of it is some is innate. Like my seeking Edith Wharton now was more just my own personal intrigue in yeah. coming across her work. And, and, and the same thing is very true with Toni Morrison, because I started yeah. reading her relatively young, and I read, you know, I nobody was necessarily instructing me in what I was supposed to be taking away from her work and uh -huh. what, what the mechanics of it may, might have been, but there was something inherently... Um, descriptive and evocative yeah. and just smart about it that I really responded right. to. And the level of kind of emotional investment that seemed to be just part of the work on the line level was something that immediately captured me. So a few things. One, yeah, I'm good at words, not all of them. What does a city do with me? Oh, like like um, uh, intent or like... Oh, no, 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 no. I'm learning to admit when I don't know... <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and then the other thing is what I'm interested in is how, what about women writers spoke to you? And I'm a, before I let yeah. you answer, I'm going to explain mm -hmm. why I'm like the, uh, the context of that question is because I did not come to women writers fairly late. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, my background is being like, I was born in a black pan-African household mm -hmm. where like the narrative was like the man was first and then like a particular mm -hmm. type of man. So a heterosexual man. So yeah. like, James Baldwin is like my favorite writer. I didn't find right. him until I'm 21. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with the politics of who was allowed to be discovered. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I like also who I was allowed to identify with. So even if I would have read him, I'm thinking in my teenage years, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't have allowed myself to identify with yeah, him. Yeah, totally. Of the politics of, yep. the, of like him being a gay man, a gay mm -hmm. black man or whatever. So my early readings was like, you know, the Malcolm X's. Yep. Like, mm -hmm. you know, those books like... Elvis Cleaver, and these are books that like these are all a part of like I would say my literary psychology. Yeah, mm -hmm. if I would give it a language, how did what what was it about women writers that yeah to you spoke to you of what of how you got well to you know I I don't think it's mere coincidence. For example, Wharton, um, even give her given her great privilege in life. A lot of her work deals with people who are in um you know 
socially improbable situations or really, fr frankly, taboo situations. Right. So Age of Innocence is a great example of that, which is that that's about a married man who basically falls in love with another woman and the, the kind of reciprocation of that emotional love and what they do about that right. situation. And I think, yeah, I mean, something about being young and queer in closet definitely drew me to that work because you, you identify with a certain emotional resonance there when you think, oh, yeah, the circumstances are drastically different, but this idea of feeling trapped or feeling yeah. judged... Um, becomes part of who you are. I mean, I think in both books I've written, the, my first book, Blue Boy, is a kind of coming of age that's about a, a young, queer, South Asian boy. Um, and in this book, you know, um, the idea that I really learned in writing this new book that my writing is usually about who is happening, not what is happening. Mm. And I think a lot of the writers that I actually really admire yeah. and a lot of the books I admire... Um, you know, are about, they take what are otherwise mundane situations mm -hmm. and they show the emotional undercurrent of what's happening with people. And yeah. that, in fact, during some of the most quotidian exchanges you might have, there are really serious emotional ramifications for what people yeah. are talking about. And yeah. so, like, um, and I told you this, yeah. but I'll say it again for people listening, like, I didn't finish the book, but where I got one of the things I underlined immediately, I underlined my books. Yeah, right. um, this is a, a, a testament that I like a book. Like, if your book isn't beat up, your book will be beat up. <laughs> you see it again. Like, you don't love, I don't love books if I don't beat them up. Because like, you could tell I've lived with it. Like, right, right, you know, right. Eaten with it by the bedside and things like, things like that. But the, on page four, you you know, you was talking about, uh, I think, Harit who comes into the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, and today, thankfully, he had an uneventful walk home. And when he slid his key into the back door of his house, he had one second of peace. But as soon as he turned that key, it was time to get in the costume. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was like immediately, like, you know, even what the cover sort of pronounces yeah. is like the tie over the, what's the? the sorry. The sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never want to pronounce things wrong. <laughs> Right. So it's just like, yeah. I'm very sensitive about that. But that idea that performance is always at play and sometimes how performance is, you know, and that's like Judith Butler sort of thing. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Performativity is part of the trap of genders. Like when you totally re repeat the, you know, the mistake over and over, it does become like a... Yeah, it becomes a kind of second... Yeah, it's a, a weird thing. It's a second language that almost becomes your default language right. because you're so used to, used to dissembling in that way. And yeah, I mean, the, the premise, as you say, that you learn this at the very beginning of the book, but her, the character who, uh, whom you're introduced to, you know, he, his sister has passed away under circumstances that you find out later, and um, he has taken it upon himself to think that if he dresses as his sister for his mother, whose eyesight is failing every night, right, right, right. he'll kind of keep her memory alive. And oddly enough, two weeks ago, I had some reviewers who found that improbable, and then two weeks ago, there was a literal story about a man in China who's been doing this for 20 years, who's been dressing as his late sister to keep his mother sane, and I was like, I'm vindicated! <laughs> but, uh, but he, um, but this idea exactly, that, like, I, with that character, I was playing with the idea that what if somebody is so emotionally stunted, or mm -hmm. society has played such a role in stunting that person, that he hasn't even had the chance to examine fully what his sexuality may be and what that means for mm -hmm. him, like what, what that means for his trajectory emotionally. So I, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, the, throughout the book, I was trying to take people who are in circumstances that expect something of them, that uh, impose certain rules on them, and yeah. then see, have them decide for themselves what they honor about those rules and right, what they right, don't right. believe to be true. And so to me, I think that this is a great, like, sort of mirror so that's play parallel like the immigrant experience mm -hmm. of people who come to the country and they have to perform American yeah right and a, a lot of times it's being asked that you perform that more than the people who mm -hmm. is, are supposed to be the ones are the arbiters of it right yeah right so like you know when I heard a friend who had like recently passed like the citizenship test mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and some of the shit that was on there, I'm like, I would have fucking failed. Like, and it's like the only yeah. thing that makes me more of a citizen than you is the fact that I was born here. Yeah. Right. right? right. In theory. Right. Yeah. Right, like, right. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> that whole idea of like, it's just interesting. There was a part in the book, um, where, um, Harrod is getting about to get hired and yeah. he's looking and like his background is like, he went to like, he's, background in commerce and yeah right what was mm -hmm. it working at You're working at a movie theater yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Right. and you become mm -hmm. a salesman and i think there's so many people who I've, I've 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 met like who are like uber drivers who are like surgeons in their home country yeah and yeah. i'm like really interested in how like what has to happen in someone's mind where like they're like a like a like a fucking astrophysicist yeah. in their country <laughs> and then they're like a doorman 
in like America. Like, well, I think there is this, there, that, you know, there's that sense that, uh, you know, I've talked to my parents about this a great deal because this is putting it in very kind of rudimentary, crude terms, but it's like, do they sometimes feel that they were like a sacrifice generation to get us over here? Right, right, right. And then like now, and that's the sacrifice they make. And, uh, and you know, people can look at that word differently, but like that is in a way, I mean, that it's, a, it's a choice they've, they've made in their lives and it has a serious effect in their lives. My parents have been in this country more than half of their lives by far at this point. Right. So they, um, you know, and so there is this idea that like taking the certain amount of privilege it even takes to be able to do that, to immigrate under circumstances, they're not refugees, you right. know? And so, um, but yeah, and then kind of who they see themselves as being now that they've been here for that long. And I think, you know, the, what I deal with in the book a great deal is that um, I was trying to take the kind of monolith of like an Indian community that people think of in a lot of literature and then really parse it out and show there are people who are more affluent than other people, more educated than other people. Mm -hmm. Class definitely comes into play because the Hearth character, for example, is at a different, he's in a different kind of socioeconomic status than most of the other Indian characters that are in the story. There's a young, there's a kind of teenager, um, young queer character that comes into the story who's been basically kicked out of his house by his yeah. Indian parents because they find out he's gay. So, so I was definitely looking at these ideas and saying, okay, it's not just one thing, but all these people are arguably they're arguably American. They live yeah. in America, and so showing that there's this larger spectrum mm -hmm. and and of who people are and how they react to that terminology. And I think th this is a great conversation to be having now because we definitely like the guy who created the whole birther movement. Mm -hmm. you know, let me see your uh, birth certificate. Is right. the guy who now runs the country? So like yeah. this is a guy who like gets to determine. He has the power now to determine. Mm -hmm in a very real way, who is and who isn't American. In your understanding of living here, um, what has been your sort of working definition of what it means to be an American? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're right, which is that what he, you know, what he tries to do in his, um, in his terminology and the words he uses is to try to just limit that idea. What, you know, it, it's all implied. So the, in, his, in his language, he implies that what it is is that you're a, you know, white American, you know, it's right. a white nationalist movement. So and that's a that's particular like, type yes. of white. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the idea that American then becomes a different term. Whereas, right. yeah, in my case, um, you know, we, when you grow up from an immigrant background, you're, you come up with this idea, or you, you grow up with the idea that in fact it's a great, it's a very wide ranging and encompassing term that, yeah, it shows people who have the spirit of, you know, hard work and collaboration and mm -hmm. supporting other people. And, and there is this, you know, we're seeing this now because it's almost like they're parallel ideas. It's mm -hmm. the idea of this, like, closed-minded, like, white nationalist movement. And then there's the idea of, like, no, but America can be this. Right. And so, like, in, in our ideal states, when we want the country to be something generally, yeah. you know, when we th like to think of ourselves as being the place of the free and people mm -hmm. who come from all around the world, so those are at odds with each other, you right. know, because one of them is one that we, we, meaning the people who have progressive values, idealize, right. and then the other one is the people who are have conservative mind views, right. they idealize. So I guess by simply having this conversation, we're seeing that they're, one of the things that holds it all together is this com the kind of great uh, contradiction and yet um, uh, openness to what the definition of that could be. Yeah, I think I think for some people they don't you don't benefit from thinking about it open mindedly, right? Because so much of your power it did, yes comes depends from where you're coming. Keeping yeah. it very contrived. That's right. And limited because it's like that's where people's power come from, and like that's a that's a to me that's like a Baldwinian yeah notion of like if you if your your position depends on someone else being locked in their position, yeah. like you too are like trapped in a sort of like closet. Like, and I, but, yeah. yeah, and I think that, you know, it, uh, now that you, you know, just talking about this, I mean, I, I, I think this to be true, but like, yeah. I think under very f rare circumstances to people who immigrate to the country, again, making the distinction between refugees and immigrants, but yeah. is that there's always an I idealization and a wish for things to be better and a, and a kind of altruism to that. You mm -hmm. know, like, like, that's why you often find that people like to say this because it's worth reminding people that Immigrant families are some of the most patriotic American families because they oh, come here in search of something yeah. that would, you know, uh, be in, in, in service of a higher purpose and a, and a shared vision and, and, and kind of supporting other people. So yeah. it's, you know, it does, it is surreal in a sense to be in a, a, a culture right now mm -hmm. where 
there are so many people who are, are who oppose that line of thinking. Right. Um, and it's demoralizing. You know, and it's also just you know, confusing as hell. Like when you have someone who like literally the language that you're defending doesn't even account for your body. Yeah. And right, you're, you're ready yes. to die for this language. Right. And it's like, it's just like, damn, like. I can understand getting angry for someone who looks like the pitcher, but when the pitcher doesn't look the way it's supposed to look, and I think that that's what, like, to me, I think rupture is also at the, at play in yeah, the book right. of like what happens when, like, the immediate, like, you're he's playing his sister, yeah, to right. to put his mother at ease, but like, how long can that performance last? Yeah, well, it's funny because you know we there's an, a cliche that people use often when they're writing, and I think a lot of I just heard a writing teacher say this to a crowd of people that she always tries to make prevent her students from doing this because it's, yeah. it's a it's a recurring thing. But like there'll be a sense up toward in the book there'll be a moment where the character looks in a mirror and then the writer describes what the character looks like and that's the conceit of how you find out what the character looks like. But that's right. a really kind of rudimentary way of of dealing with that. But it's it's odd because I have found myself so many times, even given how cliche that is, I found myself many times looking at myself like in the bathroom mirror when I'm getting ready and having this out of body moment of like, do I even exist at this point? There are so many people who are trying to push this message, message that if you're a person of color and if you're queer, yeah. you have no worth or value. And I've been dealing with this, like you're kind of saying, my yeah, whole yeah. life. And all these things that I fought for and that I think that give my life purpose and meaning and intent are being questioned by these people. Right. And it is, you know, all you can do is hold fast to the beliefs you know to be true about yourself and the the truths that you've unearthed about yourself after all these years of self-examination yeah. and thinking. Um, so I have to remind myself, it's like just because people believe those things doesn't diminish the fact that I've acknowledged them and that they've come into existence and mm -hmm. that I'm not putting them back in the bottle, so to speak. You mm -hmm. know, it's not like I'm not going to go backwards from that, that way of living. I want to go back a little bit because the thing about women writers. Mm -hmm. um, I I think I've, I've said this on the internet, like, I mean, on my Facebook page, but I like coming to women writers late um, through the, the vessel of um, Hilton Alls. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, I would definitely say to me, like, I think women are the best writers, mm -hmm. bar none. Um, and the language I come to understand about like what it is about women women's writing that is so valuable I think is the fact that these are people who have to constantly take what the world gives them yeah and right. figure out what to do with it yeah. in a way where like I think people in respects to where they are so like as a as a straight black man as a gay you mm -hmm. know Indian man like it's like if there's any American man like there's ways in which we take up certain part of the world, but there's also a way in which we don't have to t like, yeah, as right. like being still a man is like, I still could, like, you're st we're still taught like as a black man, even being born in like a, you know, a very dangerous white, mm -hmm. white man led country. They will still think something as a black man where it's like, you weren't supposed to take that shit. Whereas like with black women, there's a different, or just women a, a large, but like definitely when it comes to women of color, there's more of a thing like if you don't take it, you will die. Yeah. And so I, now yeah, you yeah. have to find a way to turn what's been given to you into something. And that's literally like, you know, when you said Toni Morrison, I really think about like literally her book, like Lewis, I was literally a manifestation of I had to write this book because I realized I had never read it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and I, I tell people that. I mean, the idea you have to you have to write the book that you would want to read and that you think needs to be in the world. Right. But I agree. I mean, you know, there there's Margaret Atwood quote that's been cited by many people given our current um, um, yeah. uh, climate, but the, the what, which is you know, men men are afraid. It was men fear. Men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. You know, and th that it, it sets the stakes that's for funny, the culture. Uh, I, I I'm pretty sure it's Atwood, that's, and I think it's from really many years ago at this point. But I think. Uh, I first of all agree. I keep thinking. I do think women writers are stronger than male writers for that very reason. Men, in many respects, because they there's a level of empathy and a level mm -hmm. of um, reckoning with yeah, reckoning with a kind of larger patriarchal culture that's they've had to be at odds with to simply yeah. fight for basic like acknowledgement of their rights. And yeah. so I, I but and I think that's why we're seeing, frankly, in the past couple of years, a lot of like young women of color are some of our most powerful writers right. and they're, and they're writing because they're, they're really grappling with these issues in a way that is, shows great empathy, but great, um, yeah. just great, uh, like complexity of thought, you know? And so yeah. I think, you and know, I definitely think like when you say that, like what I'm thinking about immediately, like even in fiction, like a lot of, when I read male writers, 
write women characters, there's such a lack of compassion. Mm hmm by and large. Not saying a yeah, that's not across the board, but, but I mean, you're, but like look when at you these, read yeah, a woman's yeah. understanding of a male character, there's a lot of compassion there. Yeah. Like right. a willingness to forgive what's been done. Like, you know, yeah. it's and it's one of the most difficult things when you talk to and I realize I've realized how to navigate white people better when I've understood in conversation with my women friends. Mm-hmm. That I'm the white guy. I'm mm-hmm. like I'm the I'm the white guy to their black guy. Uh, <laughs> that like I'm their yeah, I'm their yeah, like yeah. villain, and I'm like oh shit like oh like I never thought that I could be like the guy. And so when I really started to understand this whole thing, that the main vessel of power is getting the person who carries it to not know they have it, because right, it's hard right. to even get a real conversation when you can't even get you to address the first thing, right? How can we talk about fixing or anything when you yeah. feel like you're broken? Well, I think, you know, I, I've said this, this a lot about, um, while well, I've been talking about this book and about yeah. just how I view, um, like, the, the value of art in this climate that we're in. And the thing is, is, like, I just feel, I think personal connections to people and personal stories are how people's minds change. So, for mm-hmm. example, you can talk about a larger LGBTQ community at large, which is necessary and vital to talk about. And then there's a thing of like, for example, in my case, my being a, you know, queer Indian man in my community of people that I knew from Ohio and being able to show them like I came out, I've accomplished certain things in my life. Like I'm in a long term, like now I'm married to my husband, seeing that and understanding that it's, I was this kid, they they were like, they were the aunties and uncles I knew when I was growing up and this young kid they knew grew up and went through these challenges and is a real living breathing person right. who has you know that that has a way of changing their minds more so than generalizations they can hear about people yeah. so that's what I think the, the real power of writing and fiction is is that if you get immersed in a story that allows and you have a writer who just, just demonstrates great empathy and, and willingness to understand and you read it and it feels real to you right. that is invaluable because, but that's yeah, yeah that's yeah. also like the, the danger though right is like so many people don't read fiction yeah, <laughs> I know. yeah, but, yeah. But there's things and i already seen like i think morgan jerkins wrote a, it's like, amazing yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she, yeah, she, yeah she's yeah. dope um she wrote a, a, i think an article for the new republic if i'm not mistaken mm-hmm. about the fact that like fiction sales are like starting mm-hmm. to like mm-hmm. because of the climate people want things that's more true to life you know, and you know, as somebody who works in publishing, like I, um, so yeah, yeah, hope, yeah, yeah. Like, right, what so do you, you do? Yeah. And so this show is a lot about translating what the interiority of the literary world looks like to the outside. Right, right. So tell us what you like, where you work, what you do, and like what the duties are. Yeah, so, so I work. At, I'm a senior editor at Atria Books, which is a division of Simon and Schuster, and I do primarily narrative nonfiction. Although I do some literary fiction and some fiction in translation. No, so published Kevin Hart's book. Uh, my colleague did. Yes, oh, Dawn cool. Davis, who's amazing. She, she sits down the hall for me, uh, and she's a legend. Uh, but we, um, I do, so narrative nonfiction, meaning kind of celebrity, memoir, pop culture, mm-hmm. um, cultural history. Uh, and, you know, I do, throughout my career, I've really made it a point of publishing as diverse a list of writers as I can. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, not just for the sake of doing that, but because, yeah, it's giving voice to people who are from more marginalized communities and finding their readerships. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was telling you earlier, like I just worked on Janet Mock's uh, new book, Surpassing Certainty, yeah. and she's just incredible for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the great pleasures of working on that book with her was that it was her second memoir, right. and seeing her grow as a writer and seeing her uh, really take us... The, the book is primarily about her 20s and what she learned in her 20s and this experience and not of... not to put on blast. Yeah. She wrote it. She wrote it. Oh, she wrote okay. it. Oh, she wrote it. Those books. Right. No, but she, I'm she is a yeah. she's a journalist and a writer and a reporter through and through. Um, but the great thing about it's about her twenties and it was this different experience about yeah the universal themes of being in her twenties. But then yes, her ex- her particular experience of having been a trans woman who is passing a cis who had to disclose her um, d- d- disclose about her personal life to people that she had met. Right. Um, so that was exciting in a way to see a narrative that might have had certain conventional. Um, structures in terms of how it was laid out, but seeing how she engaged with those topics in a different way. So that's that's the great joy of my job is going right. to work on something like that where I think it's moving the conversation culturally forward yeah. in a way, uh, and with somebody who has great integrity like she does and is really invested in her work. Yeah. So yeah. let me let's let's get a little bit like more granular mm-hmm. with the detail. 
what is it that an editor does? Because what I've uh, sort of come to, like, I'm from bed Brooklyn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one, I didn't grow up ever wanting to be a writer because that wasn't something I saw. I wanted to be mm-hmm. an athlete like mm-hmm. most of the people because that's what we saw. But right. then when I got into, when I wanted to be a writer, I did not know about the other moving parts that yep. make writing possible. Yeah. And when you come in, you come in with this wide idea, like, I just want to do that. And then you learn, like, yep. well, you... You have, you know, there's markets and there's all these things. Yeah. So talk to me more about, like, what is the role of, especially when a senior editor, when you get to that yeah, level, right. like, what is the ground level work of an editor? And then what does it mean to be a senior editor? Yeah, so the editor, um, you know, people often, when they think of an editor, they think of this old romanticized false idea of a, a pencil behind the ear like scribbling away and what they're actually thinking of is a copy editor in a lot of ways okay. I mean, editors do a lot of editing and actual line line editing and stuff so that is not to dismiss that entirely but the editor's job in addition to the yes being very invested in the creative side of the work and really shaping it and getting in there and working cre- uh, um, closely with the author the editor is really a liaison meaning that the editor okay. is the kind of conduit by which all the communication runs among the publisher, the author, the author's agent, the sales team, for example, okay. publicity marketing, and then by extension of that, the audience for the book. Mm-hmm. So what you do as a senior editor, for example, um, I get projects in usually from agents who submit them to me, mm-hmm. and I read them, and I decide what value I see in the voice, in who would read it, um, what the commercial potential of it would be. Um, and then, you know, what you do is you share it in house with people. You talk about, you know, I talk about it with my editor in chief, you know, if it's the right fit tonally for our list, if we have a book similarly on the, similar on the list that would actually preclude our doing it because it's competition. And so basically you have these both commercial and creative discussions about the project. And then the agent, you know, if there's a lot of interest in the project, the agent sells it in an auction maybe, or just directly to you if that's the connection that you have. So it's really, you know, it's it's that side of it, which is the acquisition side of it. So you're acquiring projects to put mm-hmm. on the list. And then there's the idea that at any given point in time, because we have, for example, three seasons out of the year, and we're publishing books at different times, and you're thinking maybe a year, year and a half out from when you're going to publish a book you just bought. So it's a lot of time management like that. It's constant discussions about cover art and interior design and you know then working with the publicist and the marketing person to make sure you're putting a plan together to make sure for the book so it's it's this corporate almost corporate embodiment of a creative interest yeah, I, you know on the on the on in the immediate way of like how i thought about editors i immediately at first i thought about editors or a, a one one way of i of thinking about an editor was the way i think about like in rap because i, I grew mm-hmm. up in hip-hop like, mm-hmm. that was my first language mm-hmm. um was like the editor was the producer uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, that that's like a really the good. The writer was the rapper. That I, I think about that a lot. That's that's a very good um, yeah, so. uh, um, uh, analogy. And what you're yeah. describing is like the senior editor is like the executive producer. Like yeah. they're doing right. more of the like we want to we want to, we want the videos to look a certain way. We want to make sure you get the right like I don't, I don't know who's responsible for like the blurbing and things like that. Yeah, but right, like, right. We want to make sure that the packaging of what the art is gives it the best chance to survive. That's actually a good... So my, my editor, Anna DeVries, who's at Picador, who's really, really fantastic, mm. um, and I actually learned a great deal as an editor just working with her. Yeah. Um, but like an example is that there were a couple... Um, in this book, for example, there are three, three large sections of the book. And originally when I wrote the first section of it, um, it was kind of a large chunk about one of the characters, Harith, one large chunk about Ranjana, who's the other kind of main character, and then one about Prashant, who's her son. And... The book after that first part actually wove all of them together very well. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the first third of the book should probably do that too, but I was really lazy as a writer and I kind of felt like I'm too close to this. Yes, exactly. And then Anne was the one who kind of said to me, listen, you know this. This is supposed to be, you already have the structure set in this book. That's the way it should be. So it was her role as an editor in a way to kind of say, you know, think about that. Here are some ideas of how you may reorganize that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a creative decision for her. But then, for example, yeah, then she's like involved in writing the flap copy and yeah, figuring out whom we're approaching from blurbs and how that's going to work. Mm. And then what she's doing the whole time is she has to have all of these internal meetings with publicity sale and sales especially to say, you know, for example, if they if I love this cover, it was the first one they showed me, they're geniuses. But if they had done a cover that wasn't quite right and then they had a conversation, if she had a conversation with her Barnes Noble rep, rep in house who said actually our account is doesn't like this cover, then she'd have to have a different creative discussion with the designer in house and then by and then eventually me to say, mm. This is why we're changing this, this was why this needs to be different. Yeah. So it's a lot of logistical discussions that you're yeah. having with people about how now, it works. how involved are you in that discussion off the page? 
like or how involved let me let me be fair yeah. how involved do you want to be in those discussions off the page as the editor or as the as the like no, so like as a, like so and this is funny yeah, yeah, you're yeah. like you're right you understand both sides right. so like when it comes down to producing your book mm-hmm. how involved are you in like picking your covers and stuff like that i tried to be i said to them from the very beginning i was like if i go into just out there writer mode you have to stop me because i don't want to turn into one of those authors who gets like micromanages everything and tries right, to right. be you know but i i really trusted them i mean i think especially just the editing like we had done two passes of editing on the book that were very close to working together yeah. and I trusted her i mean so it's a it's all built on trust because you yeah. feel like somebody has your book and in good hands and is really working towards it so i uh, they were really good about just doing their work and i was good about trying to keeping myself at a distance being like i do this work professionally i understand the value in just letting them do their jobs because right. they're professionals just like as i would want authors of mine to understand that yeah, they yeah, have yeah. certain you know so i was trying to be very mindful of that but you, I, that isn't to say when authors kind of freak out on their end it's because yeah they're not privy to the the processes in yeah. the way that I and I mean like you know, I mean yeah. going to an MFA program I think that one of the things that um, I wish I had and the MFA program at the new school is a wonderful program yeah right. shout out to the new school yeah the MFA <laughs> program but one thing I do want for more in these programs is business yeah classes yeah. of like you know teach us how to navigate that system how to yeah. understand it right. because I think that we get so uh Pre, like we we get so drilled to think about on the page work, yeah. That we don't think about well, how does on the, like how does our pages turn into a book? And I think yeah. that like that like the 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 amount of patience you have to have to deal with these editors and these agents and what gets done. I feel like we get we get kind of turned into like we get we have like this romanticized vision of the literary. Yeah, like, I'm just right. going to write the best thing I've ever written, and it's going to someone's going to buy it right. as opposed to like what I've learned and um. Is like there's these conversations about markets and you know, yes, who, and right. it's like wait, like we didn't learn how to think that way. Yeah, and I like so for me, it's like it's not even a, a, a limit of the education. I like to expand the education of what it means to be a writer. I think that the economics and the business side, like I feel like that has to be incorporated into the art of literature. Yeah, there's a term that people use a lot now, which is being a good literary citizen. And yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. that the thing is, the good thing is there's more access to that level of discussion about the professional side of writing mm. than ever before. Morgan's actually a really good example because Morgan Jerkins, because she's a wonderful writer herself and, and she's published well and prolifically, but she also works at Catapult where she also, I think, leads workshops and gives yeah. people a sense of how to pitch pieces and how to, you know. Yeah. So that's a good example of somebody who's at the intersection of so many of those practices. Right. It's because she's really kind of figured out the scene and how to make herself both meaningful and informative. In it. Right, right, right. And that's that's an opportunity that may not have existed a few years ago because not all of those platforms were around. Yeah. So I think you're right that there's, um, the more people engage with people, engage with professionals, engage with writers, yeah. and get a first-hand experience of that, the, the more helpful it is. And I also think from a personality standpoint, I think that writers, I think us as writers, are some, I think some of the most selfish artists. <laughs> we can be. Because, I mean, well, you got to think about it, right? Like, we write books. Like, you make music, you can go with your friends to the concert. You make yeah, a movie, that's you go right. with your friends to the movie. Mm-hmm. We want you to talk. We want you to be with us for us. Ever yeah, long that's as right. It lasts. That's right. And, you know, coming from that background of, you know, where, like I said, hip-hop was my information chamber of, like, just looking at how information was shared it was communal yeah and right. so coming into a world where things are more like isolated it's just like okay i understood like i think my my through way into being a literary citizen came as like i'm asking so much of you yeah when right. i ask you to read something i have to give out like 10 times as much to even get you to in if you i want you to come into my book or whatever yeah um pause a little bit but i need to be able to beckon you to be, you know, like, to what makes you want to do this over listening to yeah, music, that's right. watch a net, like, binge watch Netflix. Like, even as a writer, I would rather binge watch than write. So it's right. like, if I'm a person who's in this art and I'm not even really yeah, dedicated right. to it, then how could I ask that of you? And I think that what's been beautiful about the literary world is the fact that more writers are turning into literary citizens. Yeah, I'm starting and to see more writers exactly, yeah, like, right, right. shouting yeah. out writers whose other books come out and like doing right. that more and more. And that's something that like I love always loved about hip hop was that hip hop was always that thing. Like there are people promoting other people's you know yeah. albums. Yeah. They're not even on the same record label. Yeah, right. Or they'll right. come out to their shows and it's like I've always like we need. I, I want. That's what the show is about. That's what it's doing. Like, like that's really why it's giving, so meaningful. Like love yeah. to other people. Um. 
what I want to do now is want to hear some of the love you got in your Oh, yeah. Before we do that, I got I to gotta put you onto this drink. Yeah, so, 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 he was doing, I was preparing. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. We, do, we do the, the scotch tape, the little homemade label. Oh, my you know. God. Um. So, what you're going to do is you're going to pop open okay. the Martinelli's bottle. Yes. Okay. I'm uh, doing that right in now. In real time, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're going to see what a wimp I am that I can't even open it. You my good. hands are kind of slippery. Yeah, you want to? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm a child. I need to be. So, I, if you don't have <laughs> you, you, what you're going to do is you're going to drink past the leaves. Okay. You're going to right below we'll the leaves. It. Okay. Done. Oh, good. Yeah. I was far. Okay. I'm All right. Good. Now, I'm going to hit you off with some of this cognac. Oh my God! This is so no. This is decadent. This is, oh, this is this is fine. This is. <laughs> oh, got too eager. Um. Now, I'm gonna swirl counterclockwise. Okay. Uh, Danny made that rule. We just gonna follow it. Okay. All right. Let me just. Delicious. Okay. Oh, oh there it goes. The lid go. again. Okay. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You for coming Thank on you show. for having me. Yeah. Refreshing. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm reading. Yeah, so Nia, I, I need you know we have to get the Marduse in. Yeah, exactly. Up the joints. Yeah, exactly. Um, lubricate the vocal. Cord. So, um, I uh, okay. So I'm gonna read. From, this is towards the beginning of the book. Um, so Hart, the character we were talking about, yeah. um, lives with his mother. You find out that he lives. Uh, so he works at a department store okay. um, in, in, in Cleveland. Uh, so I'm going to describe the carpet, the the, the um, department store, and then uh, his boss okay. uh, who owns it. It's called Harriman's is the name of the, and and just for the obvious pun, I named it that because it means hairy man, and he's a hairy man because he's Indian. <laughs> uh, so, um, Harriman's was a department store that had undergone several evolutions of decor since its birth 40 years before. Hyatt often thought of what he must have been doing while the store was being built. He would have been four then. The full wood walls were hoisted against real wood planks while he had his first taste of sweet halwa. The original tan carpet, tufts of which Hudith could still see popping up between layers of the newer navy blue carpet, was rolled into place while he sat in his open-air classroom, seeing the skeletal script of words he had until then known only by a sound. The marble staircases were given a final polish as Hudith's equally pristine souls bounded up the red stone steps of his temple. As Harriman's opening day came to a close, quaffed housewives shuttled out of the glass front doors, milkshakes from the second floor parlor in their bellies. Hudditz sat on his house's front step, licking the cool dribble off a mango popsicle. He found the job through Geetil Didi's friend Samith, who had worked briefly in the storeroom. Samith had been charged with the task of moving gigantic boxes of women's shoes from one end of that musty concrete bunker to the other. Hadith, on the other hand, parlayed his interview into the more important position of working in the men's furnishings department, not the men's department, which included dress shirts and slacks and sweaters. The men's furnishings department, which involved accoutrement, another teddyism, ties, cufflinks, suspenders, wallets, clips, hats, pocket squares, scarves, and, partly because the space devoted to it was adjacent to the men's furnishings section, but more because it didn't fit into any of the other store's categories, luggage. The department was also the also ran of the store, but working in it still beat the storeroom, even if Hadith came to realize that twiddling one's thumbs was only slightly better than sweating. Although Hadith's English was far from ideal, it was augmented by a certain attention to pronunciation and vocabulary that set it apart from that of most Indian people. This made him the best Indian presented to the people at Harriman's in quite some time. For his interview, he showed up dressed in his nicest outfit, a tailored herringbone jacket, bronze corduroy slacks, cream dress shirt, and maroon silk tie. He waited for Mr. Harriman, the general manager, in a poorly lit office on the top floor. The office was very plain. Given the grand appearance of the store, Hadith had envisioned a lavishly furnished room that resembled a professor's study, not this which brought to mind a hospital without the cleanliness, a DMV without the people. Mr. Harriman's secretary, Stella, brunette with a pointy nose and small face, carried the unmistakable expression of someone who didn't have a damn clue as to how she had ended up in a job like this. Why was she assisting the general manager of a department store when working in the store, graceful behind a perfume counter, seemed so much more attractive? Hadith could only assume that the pay was better in her current position. Mr. Harriman will see you now. She said every word as if it were new not only to him but also to her. Hadith nodded politely and walked up to her desk. She flinched slightly, and he realized that she had not intended to walk him to Mr. Harriman's door. To put her at ease, he pointed in the direction of the office, indicating that he was headed that way. 
Mr. Harriman, whose first name Huddeth never learned, was in his late 60s and was a smart dresser, contrary to the dour and unbecoming photograph of him that Huddeth would eventually see in the employee break room, E. H. Harriman, no first name, engraved on a placard under it. Huddeth would soon learn that when Mr. Harriman got particularly stressed, his skin became red and he looked like a bell pepper. His voice was by turns mellifluous and grating, and he had an unexplained southern accent. Uh, so, Mr. Singha, what brings you to Harriman's today? Huddit's last name was Sinha, but Mr. Harriman added a G to it as if it were a Thai beer. Huddit did not understand the question. Why else would he be here? I have come to see if I might find employment. Mr. Harriman threw his head back and laughed. His teeth sparkled. Right to the point, I looked at him and said, Oh, I did not come for a salesman position, Huddit said. Mr. Harriman's mouth fell into a frown and Huddit panicked. Uh, I, I would love to be considered for a salesman position, but I was informed that you need men for your storage room. Uh, yes, yes, we've had many handful boys from India, but I like the look of you, Mr. Singha. Do you have any sales experience? Hadith wished that Mr. Harriman had looked at his resume. It clearly indicated that he had done his schooling in commerce and that he had worked for several years back in India as the operator of the projector in a movie theater before coming to the States and working as a janitor at a medical supplies company. None of this made him an ideal candidate for a sales job. No, sir, just no sales experience. Do you like Harriman's? It is a nice store, sir. It, was a, it is a nice store, sir. That's the um, crowding I'm talking. Mm. This was the first time he had ever set foot in it. Well, Harriman's is the crown jewel of this community, Mr. Singha. I opened decades ago with an aim to make it the premier shopping experience in Greater Cleveland, and it is my belief that it has remained such since that time. We've survived the super mall, the cyber mall, and about a million apps that turn your phone into a mall. Huddith could tell that Mr. Harriman had given this speech several times. Throughout the years, we have employed a wide variety of employees. A former assistant manager of ours was African American. Mr. Harriman raised his eyebrows as if Huddith were supposed to be very impressed. Huddith realized in this moment that Mr. Harriman was offering him a salesman job because of his ethnicity. After the interview, Mr. Harriman walked Huddith out of the office and said to Stella, This is Mr. Singha. He's going to be working in men's furnishings. Can you get this paperwork started, sweetheart? Stella looked up at them as if Mr. Harriman had just said that Huddith were making a trip to the moon. Sorry, that was a long reading. But... No, it was not. <laughs> Definitely been one of the best readings I've heard in a very long time, especially <laughs> one of the best readings we've had on Lit. And I like the way you bring life to the characters. Thank you. Um, a lot of readings I've went to, I won't let you put yourself on the line. I'll put myself on the line. <laughs> they're just terrible. Like, the readings are just like, you know, people read expository passages yes, as right. opposed to something where, like, the, the plot or the characters are moving in some way. Right. Then when they read the dialogue, they don't differentiate. So, like, you're listening. It's the same monotone. It's like, is this a conversation? Yes, is this a, right. You know, so I, I really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate what you bring to it. Now I'm interested. In terms of the book, um, one thing you notice, mm -hmm. uh, books are big business in terms of movies, mm -hmm. right? Who would you want to see play a read? I, ha you know, I, it's funny because that conversation's kind of happening, and there's somebody in particular who has expressed interest in that, but I can't say who it is, so I have an idea, but I, um, the, th the thing that makes it um, exciting for me, and that was certainly something I was exploring in the work, is that the two main characters in this book are in their 40s, and okay. so it's a different, you know, it's not somebody young and fresh who's necessary I mean, which is which is great you know because i think at a four you, you want to see more roles i like was very like mean to old older yeah people. and you want you want you want people to have opportunities there too so i definitely have people in mind um and hopefully that will bear lead to something but okay. i um yeah i i definitely wrote the book with a kind of almost sitcom like yeah. pacing to it so that's why i've seen you know, that and yeah, yeah the reason why i asked that question is because i think so often um a lot of people do not know how many novels have been turned into Yeah, right, right. Like, I said this on the show when, like, Tracy was on the show, but, um, like, I was surprised that, like, do Die Hard was a, was a fucking novel. Yeah, yeah, I was right. like, what? Like, yeah. What yeah. does that even look like? Yeah, a novel yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot of creative friends I have, especially creative friends of color, you know, there's that echo chamber of, like, you produce these mainly white narratives yeah but they're right. buying you know mainly white books and even if they buy other books they're like how can we reimagine this book yeah. into a book that like into a narrative that's more appealing yeah right. i.e like how can we remove all the shit that makes it what what the book was yeah and so for me it's like i you know i kind of want to understand like who like nothing helps uh, more than like having that visual like, yeah right how like who would like you know as a fictional character i have my image but nothing brings something to life. So, like, what actor would, like, yeah, bring right. that person to life? Yeah. then it's, like, it makes the fiction more. Yeah. It gives right. it a, a, another life. Like, I know Handmaiden's Tale is definitely, like, I saw 
it's on like a lot of bestsellers lists and yeah. like independent bookstores simply because there's a show now. Oh, of course, and so, that's an old publishing adage yeah. that even if in that adaptation is great, but even if it's not great, it almost moves books somehow. Yeah, and that's it's because it's like it's yeah, now yeah, it's in, yeah. in, in, in play with a language that most people understand, which is yeah. most people are visual. Yeah, and like you know, we I think we are you know if this was a sport we are we are golfers. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, yeah that's we're not. Yeah. This is not a sexy sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's like, right. That's patience right. And, yeah. like I want to dunk a ball. I want to. Yeah, yeah. Be like, yeah. you, gotta, you know. So, um, where can this book be found? Where can people buy this book? I think uh, if you go on my website, rockhsethealbooks.com, but if you go on all the online retailers, indie bookstores, uh, as I say, wherever books are sold. Wherever books are sold. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yes, and I hope people will. Also, I should say, you can also, if you go if you go to no one can pronounce my name dot com, I yeah. have this thing where you we can enter. We got post production shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's all going you, when you when you enter your you can enter your name in there and it spits it back out and it actually creates the book jacket with your name on it. So if oh, that's it, dope. so if you're bad with how people mispronounce your name, you can put it in there and it, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, dope. yeah. Um, so. And where can people follow you? Uh, I'm at Rakesh Sethyal on Twitter, on Instagram, um, on Facebook, I think too. Um, and yes, yeah, <laughs> there's everything. Any like, events? Any readings? Uh, I, I just finished a big tour, but I'm going to be at, at, I'm at the Outright Festival in D.C. I'm going to, that? that's this weekend, actually, but then I'm doing, um, so that'll be in so retrospect. Yeah, but be. we'll be at the, t- I'm, I, it's not announced yet, I think, but I will be at the Texas Book Festival in, in Austin in November. So okay. that's going to be great. So if y'all yeah. in Austin, yeah. Texas, I know that's a big, that's a big, if people say that's yeah. a big. Book. It's a big one. It's a big like one. Like if you yeah, go yeah, up yeah. in Texas, you're yes, you, you good. That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So um, before you leave, of course. Like I remember when we first met at Jamie Attenberg. Yes, right, uh, right. I had asked you, and he was like, ah, oh, it's a little, you know, can we do another time? Yeah, yeah. Favorite three writers, favorite three clothing designers. Yes, favorite three, okay. Uh, well, Edith Wharton is definitely up there. Okay. I would have to put Lori Moore up there, and okay. I'd have to put Toni Morrison. So I think those three would have to be mine. Um, and then... The swag. And then swag, yeah. I... Uh, I always kind of, I know it's crazy, but I always kind of like Victor and Rolf. I kind of like how crazy over the top they were. Um, I like, uh, um, I like, uh, I like a lot of Philip Lynn stuff, which, um, uh, and this is not necessarily stuff I'm wearing even, but I I like. It's aspirational. Yes, correct. And, um, and I really love uh, Benaz Sharafpour, who's that, um, yeah. This is partially, this is research for me. Exactly. So those are the three people I think I had mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. So yeah. this is Yadon Israel, Rakesh Satyal, Rakesh yep. Satyal. Thanks for having me. Um, and this is Lit. Um, follow us at Lit Platform. Follow me at Yadon on all the channels. And we'll hire at you next week. We out.